Flood Show is a weekly one-hour program with the new Scarlet Knight head coach. Now, let's go live to the Audi Rutgers Club at High Point Solution Stadium in Piscataway. Here are your co-hosts, former Scarlet Knight player Eric Legrand and the voice of Rutgers, Chris Carlin. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Kyle Flood Show right here on 1450 WCTC, the new talk radio, and on our vision on scarletknights.com. We are in week two of the 2012 season. Rutgers getting set for their home opener this coming Saturday afternoon at 3.30 when they host Howard. And our pleasure, Eric, to welcome in the head coach of the 1-0 and Scarlet Knights, and that is Kyle Flood. How are you? I'm doing great. It's good to be back. It's All good right. to be back home. So your first collegiate win as a head coach. What, what do you think about when you think about that? It, it, was, it was great to get the first win in the first game, that's for sure. It certainly stops a lot of questions from being asked the following week. <laughs> uh, but the most exciting thing about it was really the way we won. I, I felt like you know, all three phases of the game were able to contribute in a big way, you know, whether it was Justin Dorner dropping three punts inside the 20 or Jeremy Deering with a big kickoff return at the end of the first half to set up some, some points that swung the momentum a little bit back in our favor. You know, Juwan Jamison and Savon Huggins contributing with big runs. Timmy Wright with a spectacular, spectacular Mohamed Sanu-esque catch, yeah. <laughs> you know, in the game. And, and then certainly the defense. You know, when you hold the team to eight yards rushing in a game, you're always going to have a chance to play great defense. And Brandon Jones, after having maybe a couple opportunities, you know, third time was a charm, and, and he picked it off and, and then scored for us, which was, uh, which was exciting. And we blocked another kick, which we're very proud of. We go into every game trying to block kicks and being aggressive on special teams, and we've blocked more kicks than anybody in the country over the last three years in a game. So we, we plan on keeping that alive. Hey, Coach, how did the team feel after the win, you know, down in the bayou, getting a win down in New Orleans, getting to play in that stadium? What was the atmosphere like in that locker room after the game? Well, that, the, the locker room was buzzing. Yeah. There's no doubt. The locker room was buzzing, and they, they gave me quite a reception when I got in there, which, uh, yeah. which really made me feel good. But, you know, I felt better for them than I did for myself because you, you know what it's like to be in training camp for four weeks and how yeah. hard you work through the off season, whether it's the spring or the summer. And to go out there, and, and when you win the first game, it just all seems a little bit more worth it, even though your preseason should get you ready for the entire season. You know, that first game is important. Yes. We're going to take questions live from fans here at the Audi Rutgers Club. We're going to encourage you to step up to the microphone in just a couple of minutes. We'll also get some phone calls. We might have uh, some tactical issues with that, but the phone number 732-545-WCTC, 732 732-545-9282 couple of specifics from the 24-12 win over Tulane. Ran the football extremely well. Jawan Jamison with 112 yards, a touchdown, and Savon Huggins, uh, 47 yards, including a 31-yard run. I-, I would think for an offensive line coach of old, especially, you got to feel pretty good about that. We did, we, and we as a staff, and myself included, felt like it was a good start. And I try not to make too many decisions based on you know, just one game or one series. But it, it was a great starting point for our offensive line and, and our offense in general. You know, the, the elimination of negative runs, that, that's really where it begins. The big runs are great, but if you want to have a solid running game, you've got to start by eliminating negative runs, and we did that, and we were fortunate enough to make some big ones as well. You know, that helps. Yeah, when you see a guy like Andre Silva pulling around on, on Jawan Jameson's long touchdown run and pancake the guy, how, what do you think that does for the offense, giving them confidence now? There, there's no doubt it, it gives him a tremendous amount of confidence. And you know, you've been in those practices and you've been in those middle drills, and yeah. you know, that's a play that, you know, that we, we feel is the personality of our offense. Yes. And, and it was executed very well that time. And Andre, who's a little bit new to the guard position, you know, he, he did a great job. And I think as he grows in that position, he'll get even better at it. But he did a great job finishing that block. You know, one of your other runs was Saban for 31 yards. And I thought what was really interesting about that was on the play before, he had actually fumbled the ball, got it back with Mark Harrison. You went right back to him. Is that by design in that situation to get his confidence going? It, it's, it wasn't so much that that particular moment was by design. Really, what was more by design was making sure he stayed in the game. Yeah. You know, the, the last thing I wanted for, for Saban at that point would be to have a, a mistake and then not be able to play the next play. Because we, we tell the players the most important play is the next play. That's the only one you have control over. And, and he did a great job. You know, he, again, he did something that we don't ever want to do. The ball is the program, and, and ball security is a premium when you're trying to win football games. But at the same time, you know, we don't ever talk about zeros. We talk about minimizing. You know, we want to minimize mistakes. We want to minimize turnovers because we know the players aren't perfect. They're, they're going to happen at times. But he was able to learn from it and, and did a nice job securing the ball the rest of the game. 
Yeah, and as we're talking about confidence, you think, but Gary Nova, as he started off 4 for 4 throwing a few dump passes for screens, was that game planned or was that just designed for his confidence to get him, you know, just throwing the ball to the receivers? I think when you, I think when you play against a defense that is uh, really excited, it's their home opener, we knew there was going to be a, a lot of emotion from them. We knew that they would certainly be teed up to rush the passer. I think there were some things early in the game that were by design, you know, to get the ball out of his hand and hopefully expose some of the, the, the speed of their rush coming up the field. Yeah. And then also to get the ball in the hands of people like, like Juwan Jameson, you know, who we know when you get the ball, in, anytime you get the ball in his hands, he can make people miss and, and he can turn what starts as a small run or a small completion into a big run. We'll get to your questions in just a moment at 732-545-WCTC. And again, here in person, if you're here at the Audi Rutgers Club, please step up to the microphone and we'll get to you in a moment. There's one thing I'm curious about as a civilian, if you will, and Eric and I were talking about it before. Mm-hmm. With the running game, a lot of times when you see a two-back approach, you see two guys who are of very different styles. One guy might be a scat-back type. One guy might be a power-back type. Are, are Savon and, and Jawan very similar in their styles? How, how does that kind of play out? Because you, it's not an obvious thing, I would think, at least to someone like me. I think their, their styles are subtly different. I think what happens is... Most of what happens as they get through the line of scrimmage is the same. I think where they differ is when they do get through the line of scrimmage. And as I've talked about running backs before, one of the things I think any casual observer of football can see in a running back who's on his game is a change of speed as they go through the line of scrimmage, a burst, so to speak. And I don't think I've ever coached anybody better at than Ray. And certainly Ray has continued to do that at the next level. Juwan and Savon have done a great job of reading the defenses the way we want them to and bursting through the line. That part of it is the same. I think once that happens, though, what you find is Juwan Jamison becomes a make-you-miss back at the next level, and Savon is a run-through-your-arms back. And they're significantly different once they get through the line of scrimmage. And both of their big runs were for exactly those reasons. You saw Juwan Jamison break into the open and make somebody in the secondary miss. Ends up being a big run. You you see Savon take the toss. He cuts it back a little bit, gets to the next level, and runs through the arms of two different defenders on his way to what ended up being a nice run. And, Coach, a lot of people don't know, but it takes 10 men on their men to block running down the field. And can you just talk about a little bit to the fans how it takes all 10 men and with the wide receivers doing their jobs that allowed Savon and Juwan to break those types of runs? There's no doubt. And, and on, on any given play like that, you, you'll see guys like Brandon Coleman, Karan Pratt, Mark Harrison, Timmy Wright. Mm-hmm. You know, they're down the field. In, on, in offensive football is an 11-man game all the time. Mm-hmm. It's an 11-man run game. It's an 11-man protection you know, 11-man completions. You know, it doesn't get looked at that like that sometimes. When you don't give up a lot of sacks, people say the offensive line had a great game. Well, the reality is they did have a good game, but the quarterback also did a nice job getting the ball out of his hands. The running backs did a nice job fitting into the protections. You know, everything comes into play in offensive football. One guy can't do it by himself. No better example than a play where Savon did fumble the ball, and who's there to jump on it? Mark Harrison. Yeah. If Mark Harrison doesn't get that ball, Savon's big run may never happen. Let's get some questions right here at the Audi Rutgers Club. Your name, where you're from, and your question. Matt Orlando from East Brunswick. Uh, coach, congratulations on your uh, first win as a Scarlet Knight head coach. Feels Thank good you. to be a uh, 1-0. Oh. Um, two-part question, short and sweet. On the coaching staff currently, who's the primary play caller? And the second part is, how much involvement do you have on a play-to-play or series-to-series basis with the play calling? I'll answer the second part first. You know, We have a, an expression in our staff room uh, for a long time. This is not something that I created that silence is agreement. So as the head coach, at any point in the game on offense, defense, or special teams, I can stop the play that's being called and and call whatever play I want. Now, I don't exercise that ability very often because I have tremendous confidence in the people that do play the, that do call the plays. You know, Dave Brock on offense, he calls our offense. You know, Rob Smith on defense, he calls our defense. And Joe Rossi in special teams. Now, special teams is a little bit different because we kind of map that out before the game ever starts. But we had to make an adjustment early in the first half of the game. We want to be very aggressive. We want to block kicks. So we certainly had some punt block situations that came up, but they didn't give us the formations that we were expecting. Well, at that point, you can't do it. So we had to make an adjustment. We had to get to our return game a little bit until we could put in a block and then attack them in the second half. Well, I think that that's an interesting question because you don't know how these dynamics work. And when you have a new staff like you do, I would guess that it's kind of a feeling out process, isn't it? I'm fortunate because our officer coordinator, Dave Brock, even though he's new to our staff, I worked with Dave for five years. Officer, right? We did. And for two of those years, he was the offensive coordinator. So, you know, that's given me some familiarity. 
and even having worked with Rob Smith for three years, I coached against Rob Smith when he was at Maine. So I have a lot of familiarity with Rob. But I, I think what people don't realize maybe in the, uh, in, the, in the outside world, as I will call it, <laughs> outside of coaching, is that a lot of the game gets called prior to the game. You know, there are certain situations that are mapped out. And, you know, whether it's first and 10, P and 10 to start a drive, E and 10 after a first down. You know, on defense, you have your list of calls that you're going to go to. On offense, you have your list of calls. And it's just a matter of picking which one you want, depending on the hash and depending on the field zone. But there certainly is a little bit of feel to it. But a lot of it is also mapped out. And how do you get the players to buy into that? You know, all these different coaches calling plays. Do you believe that they that the players really trust what is going on out there? I do. I really do. And on defense, I'll start there because Rob Smith allowed us to keep our defensive system in place. And you mm-hmm. played in that defense. Yeah. And, and you know the recent history of the Rutgers defense and how successful we've been. And that defense hasn't changed. And we have a group of players on defense that have had a lot of success in this system. And they certainly have a lot of confidence in the system. Mm-hmm. You know, on offense – we started to gain some of that confidence that the defense already had in the last third of the season last year and into the bowl game. And I feel like we've been able to build on that through the spring and then into training camp, and I think a lot of that came out in the first game. One or two defensive things from the game the other night. Uh, number one, Kasim Green continues to be remarkably productive. 14 tackles, a sack the other night, looking like he picked up pretty much where he left off. You know, Ever since he moved to linebacker, I've always been curious. Eric and I were talking about this before. What allows Kasim to be as productive as he has been? Because he's putting up numbers that we haven't seen around here in a long time. You know, Kasim is in a position in our offense that is designed to be a playmaker position. A lot of what we do on defense gets funneled towards him. And that is not to in any way devalue what he does statistically because you have to have a guy who makes those plays. Yeah. And again, if you're going to do that on defense – you have to have somebody back there who can make those tackles. But not only does he make those tackles, he makes the tackles for loss. You know, he makes the, the sacks in the backfield. You know, his transition from safety to linebacker, in my opinion, has been remarkable. You know, I've never been around another guy in 19 years who has made that type of transition as successfully as quickly. And I remember the first spring where he did it, there were some growing pains, and the speed of the game is different when you're standing at 4 or 5 yards as opposed to when you're standing at 10 to 12 yards. But after that initial transition period, I mean, you would if you watch this guy on Saturdays, you would think he's been playing linebacker his whole life. Yeah, let's talk about the maturity now. Brandon Jones, two balls came to him. The tough, first one was tough. The second one was right in his hands. And then he comes back on the third one and intercepts it. How do you think, you know, that shows how he's a veteran out there now, been able to bounce back from two dropped ones and then score a touchdown on the third one? Absolutely. Uh, Brandon is a senior for us, and I don't know if, if the casual fan appreciates the value of your seniors and even your third and fourth year juniors as much as coaches do. Mm-hmm. You have so much of your football program invested in those players and you, you lean on them in games to make plays and make the right decisions. And, you know, as you know, we, when he didn't get the first two, we give him a little CTO, TTY. Yeah. That's the ones <laughs> they throw you. <laughs> but, but I had no doubt in my mind that at some point he was going to be able to make that play. You know, I just mm-hmm. felt there was opportunities, and Brandon's too good a football player not to make that play. Mm-hmm. We're going to get to your questions. Again, if you have questions here in person, come up to the microphone. We will get to you. We can also take some on Twitter, and we're going to do that right now. You can tweet at me, which is Chris Carlin, SNY, on Twitter. We'll get them in. This one is from John Newcoach. Explain the effect on the team that an early arriving vocal home crowd can have, of course, with the home opener, especially this week. It energizes the whole program. There, there's no better way I could say it than that. And, and I've been the last couple months talking to a lot of the Greek organizations on campus, and I know that they're excited to get to High Point Solution Stadium this Saturday. You know, just today I was down with the band down in the stadium. They were doing their final dress rehearsal for the game, and I know that they're, they, they as a group and their families are really excited for the game. And we're going to have a little pep rally on Friday and hopefully engage this freshman class at Rutgers and, and really get this thing started the right way and fill, that, fill that, uh, that student section. And it's right there when we come out of the tunnel. As we come out of the tunnel, that student section is right there to the left. And whether they're the ones that are wearing Eric LeGrand jerseys or they're, or they're the crazy face painters you know, or the people holding up the big Tim Pernetti heads, you know, we, we love them. We love them. There it is right there. there is. We, we knew they were here. We knew. But they are – they are, they are an energizing force for our football team. And, and the play, you'll hear the players talk about it when they're, when they're in the tunnel coming down and the fans and, and the young people are banging on that tunnel. It, it's, uh, 
is no doubt it's an advantage for us. Eric, what effect did that have on the players? It's a huge effect. You know, when you come out to warm-ups, you see how the stadium is packed, and then more people start to come in. So you're thinking, like, is this going to be a packed game? It's going to be a sold-out game. But then when you come out right before you take the field and you see that student section rocking, I'm telling you, it brings a whole adrenaline rush to everybody out there and get you going ready to go out there and perform in front of your fans and get that to win. More questions coming up in just a few, but Coach mentioned the pep rally. That is this Friday, September the 7th, going to be from 5 to 6, and it's at the Student Involvement Fair Stage at Voorhees Mall in front of Murray Hall. You're going to be there. Players are going to be there. Free T-shirts, first 500 students, and I have a DJ, cheerleaders. This is going to be a, a, a great setup, and we've had the pep rallies before the bowl games over the years, and that's always kind of been an energetic type thing. Mm-hmm. You know, to get them fired up going into Saturday, it's got to mean a lot to you. It means the world. We're going to bring the whole team there, yep. and I know sometimes we've done that and sometimes we haven't, but I think this year our first home game, We've got a team that's really excited to get in that stadium, and and I want the student body to see exactly how excited we are, and I want our team to see exactly how excited the students are, and we're hoping to see everybody out there this Friday. Well, that's Friday again, 5 o'clock, Student Involvement Fair Stage on Voorhees Mall in front of Murray Hall. We've got more questions coming up. Stay with us. We are just getting rolling on the Kyle Flood Show here on our vision on scarletknights.com and on the new talk radio 1450 WCTC. From Nelligan Sports, this is the Kyle Flood Show. Brother Jimmy's Barbecue has been serving up great times as well as some of the best barbecue this side of North Carolina. And now Brother Jimmy's is opening in downtown New Brunswick on the corner of Easton Avenue and Wall Street. We are the official provider to Rutgers football and are proud to announce who will be the 2012 host of Coach Flood's weekly radio show every Wednesday night. So come on down to Brother Jimmy's and put some south in your mouth. For reservations and event information, visit us at BrotherJimmy's.com. Brother Jimmy's Barbecue, located at 5 Easton Avenue, New Brunswick, New Jersey. See y'all soon. Today, the world is more opinionated than ever before, so you tend to take notice when everyone agrees on something, like the opinions drivers have about the new Audi A4 with its dramatic redesigned LED lights, MMI with Audi Connect and navigation enhanced by Google Earth. It's no wonder Strategic Vision ranked the A4 highest total quality in its class. See the new Audi A4 at your nearest New Jersey Audi dealer today. Your New Jersey Audi dealers, proud sponsors of Rutgers Athletics. TheBeachBeat.com. It's the only place you need to be. Do you want to learn how to stand up, paddle, or surf? Do you want to learn how to cook the trendiest dishes and drinks that are served at all your favorite restaurants? Do you want to learn when the best events will be? TheBeachBeat.com. It's the only place you need to be. When you want the latest high school and college football scores, this Saturday, Football USA is the place to be on the new Talk Radio 1450 WCTC. Join Tom Mortuso and me, Mike Pavlich, go at 11 a.m. We'll preview Rutgers' home opener against Howard, go around the Big East, the Top 25, and the Central Jersey high school scene on the opening weekend of the season. That's Football USA, Saturday at 11 a.m. on the new Talk Radio 1450 WCTC and WCTCAM.com, the voice of Central Jersey sports. Now, back to the Audi Rutgers Club at High Point Solution Stadium in Piscataway for more of the Kyle Flood Show on the new talk radio, 1450 WCTC and WCTCAM.com. Once again, here are your co-hosts, Chris Carlin and Eric Legrand, along with Rutgers head football coach, Kyle Flood. We're at the Audi Rutgers Club at High Point Solution Stadium. Week two of the Kyle Flood Show right here on our vision on ScarletKnight.com. And the New Talk Radio 1450 WCTC, Brother Jimmy's Barbecue, the official barbecue provider to Rutgers football. It is the perfect destination for all things barbecue, sports, and fun. All right, we've got some bigger picture things to talk about. We'll also talk about getting ready for Howard this coming Saturday. I do want to bring up the newest Scarlet Knight, and that is Sheldon Royster, transfer from the University of South Carolina. Tell us a little bit about him, Coach. Well, we we are excited to welcome him to our program and Sheldon being a, a St. Peter's uh, prep in Jersey City alum is somebody that I actually was involved in the recruiting process with because that was uh, the county and the school that I that I was assigned to and we've you know we thought very highly of, of Sheldon coming out of high school and we thought he could be a difference maker for us and we didn't know if it would be a corner or safety and it's going to take us a couple weeks now as we work with him to figure it out 
but we feel like going forward after this year, he's going to be somebody that's going to be a major contributor for us. I don't think he's feeling now being back in New Jersey, back on campus, you know, his hometown. This is this is where he's from. How do you think he's, he's feeling now adjusting to it? I got to believe that, that in his mind it's it's home sweet home. Yeah. And he's got his teammates, Savon Huggins and Keith Lumpkin, here with him mm-hmm. and a lot of guys that he played in All-Star games with and certainly went through the recruiting process with. I got to believe he feels welcome. Absolutely. You know, Coach, uh, to have a couple of guys here like that, I, I would imagine that that's going to make a guy feel a little bit more comfortable, but it's a little bit about recruiting in general, too, because a lot of these guys, they know about each other. They know each other personally before they get here. They do, and a lot of the top recruits, you know, they they travel in the same circles. And yeah. now, because of social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, whatever it happens to be, it's so easy for them to stay in touch. And they do, and, and you find that a lot of these top guys, they really do know each other before they they ever get to the college campuses. All right, let's get to a couple of questions here. We have a question from this young lady right over here. Your name, where you're Thank from? Thank you. My name is Helen Perillo. I'm an employee here of RU, but a big supporter of the football team, and welcome. Thank you. But my question is not a question. It's just to wish Mr. Legrand a belated happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Getting old now, Chris. The gray hairs are next. Oh, ah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, stop. I'll take gray over none. <laughs> <laughs> 22, right? 22. 22 years. Feel any different? Eh, a little bit. A little, a little bit older. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get more of your questions in in just a few moments. Let's talk a little bit about kind of how things have worked leading up to this home opener. In terms of your preparation, you know, last week you go on the road for your first game. How is it different as a staff in preparing for a home game as opposed to on the road? Timing-wise, everything involved. Well, I can tell you this. There's a lot more ticket requests at home. (laughs) That's for sure. Certainly a lot more ticket requests now that I'm the head coach. But other than that, we try to keep the preparation the same. Really, every week is the same for us. And other than the fact that for a road game, we may get on a plane or a bus wherever we happen to be playing, the itineraries are the same. And, and they all backtrack from whatever kickoff time is. And even when we're home, we stay, you know, we stay at, at the Hyatt in New Brunswick. So you know, we get off campus and, and we go through our routine, you know, whether it's meetings, walkthroughs, meals. You know, all the meals are the same. The menus are the same. You know, that part of it we try to make as, as consistent as possible. You know, Coach, um, with that being the case, now – that you're in a situation where you are the head coach, how much do you, I kind of, I guess say, get involved with all the little things that have to get done around the program? I think you have to be involved. But at the same time, you have to have people above you and below you that you really trust. And I'm fortunate here. You know, I have Tim Pernetti as the athletic director. Tim is a a former uh, Rutgers football player here. He knows what this program is all about. He has a great vision for our entire athletic department. So there are certain marketing things that I don't need to be involved in because they're already in good hands between Tim and and Jason Baum. And there's other operational issues, the the hotel, the meeting rooms, those kind of setups where I have somebody like Will Gilkison, who's a former captain here, who really runs my operations department. And he does a tremendous job, you know, all the way to the point I just told the story to the touchdown club. He's down in New Orleans, and he goes down the day before to make sure everything's set up the right way so that when we get there, we just run the routine. Well, he gets down there, and the hotel we're supposed to stay at and at the airport doesn't have electricity. Mm-hmm. So there, now there's a chance they might have electricity the next, the next day, but he's not sure. So he gets another hotel, just as serviceable for us, and he calls me. And, I, you know, again, my first game as a head coach, I was hesitant at first about doing it. And finally I said, you know what, Will? You're the guy who's down there. You can see the situation better than anybody. I trust you to make the decision. And sure enough, we get down there, and the hotel we were supposed to stay at was at the airport. We went by it, and it was pitch black the next day still. It still didn't have have electricity. So it was a great job by him, other than the fact that we let the players know so they could tell their families where we were staying. The players didn't even have to know because once we got to the hotel, everything is the same. Hey, Coach, I want to go back to a little bit about practice now. Do you bring practice into the stadium more? Because I know, playing a former player, when you get to practice in the stadium, you get more of that game feeling you know, than being on the practice field. But do you bring it, like, before a home game now, before you open up, would you bring a practice to the stadium? Well, you know, we still, we still do it Sunday nights. We still yes. have Sunday night football in the stadium. I'm sure you remember that. <laughs> yes, I do. You know, we did, it, uh, we did it before the first game, before we broke training camp. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that Friday before we broke camp for two days, before we came back to start the official game week for Tulane, we had a Friday night practice 
in the stadium under the lights because I wanted to make sure that we had done that one time. And we do the scrimmages in the stadium because yeah. the scrimmages are different than practice. And you try to give it as much of a game simulation feel as possible. Other than that, we stay on the practice fields more so because of the space availability. You know, it's a little tighter in the stadium yeah. because of the expansion and the new stands than, than it used to be when I first got here in 2005. So now to be out there, you know, whether it's the two grass fields or, or F3, the one turf field out there, we have a little more space to spread out. It's a little safer. Unfortunately, because of some technical issues, we can't take phone calls tonight. But, again, we do encourage you, if you're in attendance here at the Audi Rutgers Club, to come up, get to the microphone, your chance to ask the coach a question. Also, you can tweet at me at Chris Carlin SNY. We'll get to one of those in just a sec. We have a young man over here who's got a question for you, Coach. This guy's a big Tim Pernetti fan. <laughs> <laughs> coach, congratulations on the win again. Thank you. My name's Mike. I'm a student here at Rutgers. And my question is, how do you focus on a team like Howard and then not look ahead to USF or Arkansas coming up? So how do you stay focused? It's a very common question. I think what you'll find coaches will tell you is, all you have to do is look around the country and you find motivation immediately, whether it's you know, the game ver of, of Pitt and Youngstown State last, last week. You know, certainly uh, not, some, not an outcome that people saw coming, so to speak. Uh, App State in Michigan a couple of years ago, even in our past, and I'm fortunate to say that I was not here for it, but I know in 2004 you know, there was a game like that in, in the recent Rutgers history where you know, we came out on the wrong side of the, of the wins and losses. So... Your football team has to show up every week to play because the other team, regardless of what level they come from, they've got a group of 18 to 22-year-olds just like you do that are highly motivated, that are well-coached, that have had worked really hard in the offseason, and they're not coming here to give you the win. They're coming here to take it away from you. And if you, if you don't show up ready to play, you could be in for a game that you didn't expect. You know, what I think we have this year, I think we have a very mature football team. And I said that because I've been asked that question a couple times this week. I don't fear that in any way. I think we've got a very mature football team. I think they're very focused on what's right ahead of us. Even though we're conscious of the big picture and what's coming down the road, we're very, very, very focused on what's going to happen this Saturday. So no jitters at all, Coach? You know, I've never been one to have too many jitters. Yeah. I've been fortunate. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking forward to coming down the tunnel on Saturday and, uh, and then kicking it off and, and, and watching these players play. You know, by the way, you have a Howard team coming in, and we'll get more into the game in just a little bit, but – they're flying high. They came back, got a huge win against Morehouse in a in the nation's classic at RFK uh, this past week, or FedEx Field, excuse me. And, you know, they had a come-from-behind win, and they know coming here, I mean, what that could do for their program. There's no doubt. And, you know, just to, sometimes we get questions about, you know, some of the younger players in the program, and sometimes you don't even know about them until they go in. I, you know, they were, they were uh, in a situation where they had to put a true freshman quarterback in the game, and, and that quarterback down the stretch goes 10 of 11 and leads them to a touchdown score in the last minute of the game that ultimately wins the game for them. You know, in RFK Stadium, in a big venue. So they are, they are certainly flying high, and, and they're going to be a great challenge for us. That freshman quarterback is Jamie Cunningham, and you'll hear his name to start the game on Saturday because right after the game, Gary Harrell said, yeah, he's going to start next week. After he goes 10 of 11 down the stretch to help them in that football game. I can understand that. So now with true freshmen, you know, with some injuries, do you see any of the Rutgers true freshmen now stepping up with somebody like Marvin Booker down or Paul? Do you see any of them coming into play? We've got, you know, we've got some young guys that are playing. They're not necessarily true freshmen, but, you know, with, with Paul not, you know, with Paul getting dinged up a little bit, you know, Tyler, Clark, Tyler Croft stepped in and did a really nice job for us on Saturday. You know, with Marvin Booker being down, Miles Jackson had an opportunity to step in and, and really did a nice job on Saturday. So it was a good start for both of those guys. And then we've got other freshmen that are playing for us. You know, a guy like Kyle Federico, who, uh, who missed the first one and then made his next kick and then, and, then, uh, and then some extra points after that, which was great to see that. He's got a, a great demeanor about him. He's going to be an excellent kicker here over the next four years. And mm -hmm. Darius Hamilton in there mixing it up at defensive yeah. tackle. And you know that's not the easiest yeah, thing to buddy. be a, a freshman <laughs> defensive lineman. Exactly. You know, and he, uh, he showed very well in that game. And it's going to be exciting to see how he progresses as the year goes on. We've got more questions coming in on Twitter. They're coming pretty fast. We'll get to them. But this uh, young lady has a question here for the coach. Um, hi, coach. Um, a lot of teams around the country have big wins that – Maybe they're not expected to have. We've had big wins in the past, and I'm sure we're going to get big ones in the future with you. Um, and then the next week, they kind of drop the ball and lose one that they shouldn't really lose. Do you have a plan to kind of help our guys come from a big win and stay focused for the next game, regardless of whether it's a big game? Uh, well, I guess some would say all games are big games, but... I would say that. I'm sure you would. <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, to, to not drop the, the ball the week after a big game? It's a great question that you ask. And in a lot of ways, success is harder to handle at times than failure is. You know, failure a lot of times can be a much easier motivator. You know, when you don't get what you want, it's very easy to turn around and, and say, I'm going to work even harder because I didn't get what I wanted. Sometimes when you do get what you want and people are saying good things to you and nice things to you all the time, it's not always as easy to stay motivated. I think that's why you have to have ultimate goals. You know, and, and for our football team, you know, our goal is to win championships. And here we have been good enough in recent history to win bowl championships, really to win five of them in a row, which only three teams in the country have done. So we've achieved at a high level, but it's not the level that we ultimately set out for. You know, what we want to do is we want to compete and win Big East championships and national championships. And I think if you keep that in the forefront of your mind, it'll help you through those times when you're having success, but you need to get focused on the next week. We've got a couple of questions on Twitter. First one's from Adam, and this is interesting. It's, it's kind of a big-picture college football question. Interested to hear, Coach, your thoughts on if polls shouldn't exist until October to let teams be judged after they have a few games under their belt. What do you think about that? I did an interview on ESPN on their college football show, and they asked me that question, and I said that I thought they should wait four games. Yeah. Which I didn't get a great reception from the announcers on the, on the show. I guess they, <laughs> <laughs> they were not in favor of my answer. But I do really believe that because college football, there's such a changing dynamic year to year. The teams are never the same. I think uh, Nick Saban had a great quote before they played the Michigan game where somebody in an interview had called them the defending national championship champions. And he said, there is no defending national champion in college football because your team is so different. We happen to be the reigning national champions. And it was a great way to explain what college football is and how fast the dynamics of it can change. So you don't see any preseason records, you know, like the Big East at South Florida number two, Rutgers at number three. You don't really agree with any of those terms, as you could say, in the preseason? I think it's fun for the fans. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fun for the media. And I think it creates topics of conversation on the radio. But look no further than Rutgers last year being picked preseason last in the Big East. Yep. And we won nine games. So ultimately, it's going to be the, the rankings and the honors that you earn through the season that people are really going to remember. Uh, one or two more here on Twitter. Again, if you have a question for Coach, you're in attendance here. Come on up to the microphone. We'll get you right on. Mike Smith, are you on Twitter? Will there be any new game day traditions like the axe and the stump from a couple of years back? And what, what are the game day traditions that are going to stay? Are there any, is there anything new that you're going to do? I will run out of the tunnel. That will be one. <laughs> <laughs> but I will not run out with the team. I'm just going to get out of the tunnel. I'm going to get out of the team's way and let them come on the field. That'll be one that I plan on keeping alive here for a long time. <laughs> Uh, we will carry the axe onto the field. Uh, we don't have any plans right now for a stump of any kind, but we will carry the axe out there, and that's just kind of a symbol for our team of how we go about business. And then uh, other than that, I, I think the game day operation will be very similar. Also, the Scarlet Walk still intact. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. Well, absolutely. I think things like the Scarlet Walk and the axe, they're bigger than any one person or any one head coach. Th those are a part of Rutgers football, and, and they should be here forever. So do you think the, tr the true freshman are ready to walk through that, you know? I remember being a freshman coming down that Scarlet Walk, seeing all the fans. That got me amped up like I was ready to go out there and make all the sacks that game. But, you know, you think that gets them amped up? I do. I think, it's, I think it's, a special, it's a special tradition we have, and I think it touches our players in a great way where they get to see how much the fans support them and especially the younger fans that are out there. You, know, you really get an appreciation for how some of the younger people who come to our games look up to our players. Got more time to get your questions in. Again, you can tweet me at Chris Carlin SNY. We'll get them into coach. And also, if you're in, uh, in attendance here at the Audi Rutgers Club, unfortunately, we cannot take phone calls tonight. We're going to get in to not only the game this weekend against Howard, a couple of other questions, including how coach decides at this point in the year and when he decides whether or not some of these true freshmen will redshirt. So we'll get into that coming up in just a few minutes. Stay with us. We've got a lot still to do on the Kyle Flood Show. So stay with us. From Nelligan Sports, this is the Kyle Flood Show. AT&T asks, are you that guy? That guy who not only paints his face to cheer on his team, but then paints his entire torso? Well, you don't have to be that guy to prove your fanhood. Switch to AT&T, the nation's fastest mobile broadband network. Get scores in a flash and highlights in a jiffy. It sure beats belly paint. 
You have the speed to follow your favorite sports from almost anywhere in the network of possibilities. AT&T. Rethink possible. Mobile broadband not available in all areas. Visit att.com or store for details. Investors Bank is a proud sponsor of Rutgers Scarlet Knights football. With branches throughout New Jersey, we're here to help you with all your personal and business banking needs. Investors gives back to New Jersey's communities. Visit one of our branches and experience the investors' difference. For a branch near you, call us at 855-I-BANK-4-U. That's 855-I-B-A-N-K, number 4-U, or visit myinvestorsbank.com. That's myinvestorsbank.com. Member FDIC. Like, remember the 80s? The video arcade was the cool place to hang out. A film about guys who chase ghosts was the hot movie. And you could get an annual gym membership for about 20 bucks a month. Well, the arcades have all closed. The movies on DVD and the days of the $20 monthly plan are long gone. But not at Retro Fitness. Retro Fitness is the most affordable health club ever. Where your $19.99 plus tax monthly membership fee is guaranteed for life. At Retro Fitness. It's more about fitness for less money in an always clean and friendly atmosphere. Retro Fitness offers tons of cardio machines, each with personal LCD screens, tanning and massage beds, personal or group training, and much more. Chill out at the totally awesome Retro Blends Juice Bar or sweat off the calories while enjoying your favorite movies in the Retro Room Theater. Retro Fitness in North Brunswick on Route 1 South behind Longhorn Steakhouse and CVS Pharmacy and coming soon to Hillsboro. Call 732-297-5213. Retro Fitness, we get you. Now, more of the Kyle Flood Show, the weekly hour-long program with the head football coach of the Rutgers Scarlet Knights on the new talk radio, 1450 WCTC and WCTCAM.com. Let's go back to your co-hosts, Chris Carlin and Eric O'Brien at the Audi Rutgers Club at High Point Solutions Stadium in Piscataway. Brother Jimmy's Barbecue, the official barbecue provider to Rutgers football. It is the perfect destination for all things barbecue, sports, and fun. We are back at the Audi Rutgers Club. We've got time to get as many questions in as we can on Twitter and also here in person. But I do want to mention this, and this is going to be a great setup come Saturday. Two mm-hmm. things. Number one, the Block R Party, which will be set up in Athletes Glen. This is new this year. There's going to be food. It's going to be kind of a sports bar type atmosphere. It's free to enter. There's going to be live entertainment three hours prior to kickoff. It's really going to be a terrific part of the tailgating game day experience. And I, I don't know about you. I'm always a little bit jealous of the fact that the last few years, I, last 10 years, I haven't been able to go out and tailgate <laughs> at all. And I am a tailgating guy. I've been trying to get out there. Pretty good. <laughs> But I, I don't. I don't think Tim is going to appreciate it if I go out there prior to the game. But I, but I do think college football should be an event. You know, the, you get, we get six Saturdays this year to host football games. You know, right here at our stadium, and we hope to make those those six games six days of a great experience, not just a three hour football game. I can tell. You know, as a player, I always wanted to go to a tailgate too. You <laughs> you always miss out on stuff like that. But I think the student body. You know, you think they'll be all. Up and wrong for something like a bar atmosphere to go out there and have a tailgate just like that over at Athletes Glen? I think our student body is, is going to be really excited. You know, this mm. is the only home game we have this September. Mm. I, I think they're chomping at the bit to get out there. Oh, yeah. Now, talking about excited, we see it's a good thing that we're on camera and on our vision <laughs> because this is a new delicacy that will be available at High Point Solution Stadium beginning this Saturday in the south end zone. They are flooded tater tots <laughs> flooded tater tots now i'll clap for that yeah, <laughs> i will clap for it considering i just had one same and here I, I am on board what do you think Keith? they're good I, i'm usually picky too i don't like a lot of stuff on mine yeah. but that i don't know what it is in there but it's the aim good to me looks like we got some cheese in there yeah, we got yeah, some sour, sour cream, cream. Uh-huh. i'm gonna, gonna bring up the only guy here that could possibly yeah. appreciate this more than me is my son kyle come on up here come on. <laughs> <laughs> and i know if anybody likes a good potato, it's this guy right here. Put that in your mouth and see what you think. Fire away. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, really good. <laughs> Not just good, really good. You know what, Kyle? Take Kyle. these before the rest of us see them. <laughs> Turn right. the rest of the show. But Enjoy those, those. Are, again, South End Zone, flooded tater tots. i, I got to find out exactly when the concession stands open up because they're starting to drive me nuts. Let's, let's get a, a question in from the, uh, this young lady over here. What's your name and where are you from? My name is Ann Gentile, G-E-N-T-I-L-E, Gentile. There's going to be a quiz later. Gentile. <laughs> and I lived in Highland Park in 1964 for five years 
Both of my sons, Peter, who's here, is now a graduate with a master's degree from Rutgers. Excellent. And my other son went to the Naval Academy. You know. Boom. Uh, no, I can't uh, go to the Naval Academy. Sorry. Well, <laughs> you have to understand that his father, my husband, my dear husband, went to uh, uh, Newport, Rhode Island, in the Peace Time Navy. Sure. Navy. Therefore, I have uh, St. Peter for St. Peter's Hospital and King David for <laughs> King David. David. What's Eric, your question for coach? First of all, and now I live in Hackettstown after five years, but originally I'm from the New York, Queens, Williamsburg area. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I want to welcome you, coach. We must be living near each other in Queens. I live near the Cypress Hills. In Queens, everybody lives near each other. No, no, no. Kew Gardens. Kew Gardens. Very close. Cypress Hill. Where do you live? Well, we, my family started in Middle Village, and we, then we're now we're in Middle Village, right on Metropolitan Avenue. Millbrook? Mitch, Middle Village, right, right on Metropolitan Avenue, and now my parents live in Bayside. Well, I have a brother that lived in Merrick, he's deceased. One in ba Babylon, and then Manorville. All the way out by Shirley, oh Long Island. That's, that's Blair Bynes territory. Is everybody oh. taking notes? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, did, you have a, did you have a question for Coach? Coach, I want to say welcome to the neighborhood. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Not much of a football. I know a little bit of it. My husband never took the time to say, Ann, do this and that and that. I know what a touchdown is and all that. My wife <laughs> says the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and Eric, I want to wish you God's blessing even more. You're doing so well. And you want to know, I prayed for you along with, with Coach Chiano and everybody else. Thank you. Keep Absolutely. believing. Keep and, believing. And I want you to know, as being a Catholic, my heart goes out to you. I just had major uh, chest a surgery. I'm at eight days from now from from the hospital. Will you want to dance? <laughs> All right. I'll be ready to dance and give you a few months. <laughs> I'll dance with you. Okay, I'm down with that. Thank you I'm so down much, with it. <laughs> you bug. You have really to teach me that. <laughs> so, so fox track. <laughs> Coach, again, God bless you, and keep. Keep them touchdown. Touchdown. Rutgers. Yay, Rutgers. <laughs> Terrific job. Let's get a, a couple of more questions. And the one thing I, I really am curious about, you know, from the outside looking, and we don't really get a chance to kind of know how this, how you go through this decision-making process. And that is all about how you decide whether a guy is going to redshirt as a freshman or whether he's going to be able to contribute and kind of the timeline there where that de de decision is made. Take us through that, and, and are you kind of still going through that right now? It, it really is a process. It's, it's not a, a steadfast decision. The first thing we have to do is actually get him on campus. And because of the way the rules are set up, we're not even allowed to work with him in the summertime. You know, Jeremy Cole and his staff, they do their stuff in the summertime, but as football coaches, we're not allowed to. So we don't even have an idea really before training camp other than to look at them and say, okay, maybe this one is a little more physically mature than this guy or maybe we have a little bit more of a need in this position than that one. It's really the first week and two weeks in training camp where we have a much better idea of who the guys are that are going to play. I'll give you a great example. You know, Darius Hamilton, as soon as we put the pads on, you could see that Darius was going to be a guy that was going to be able to contribute for us. Mm -hmm. And until you put them in that situation where they're going against 22- and 23-year-old men, it's tough to say that. You know, I remember Eric being a freshman and doing it. And now you know, we have some other guys that are a little bit on the bubble, and it'll depend partially on how they come along over the next couple of weeks and also partially on how healthy our team stays because you could have a couple injuries here or there, and then you have a need, and now you need some of those younger guys to step up. Can you explain a little bit about how the players feel once they are picked to redshirt? You know, some people, their confidence go down. How do you think they all stay a part of the team now that they're joining the scout teams? They're not going to be playing on Saturday. They're not going to be recognized after coming out of high school being such a highly recruit. How do you think they feel after that? I think most of the players want to play right away. Mm -hmm. you know, they want to come here and they want to get on the field. And they want to contribute. But the reality is less than half of them do. And what we try to express to them is that every player needs to run their own race. Nobody's, no two careers are going to be the same. I can point to 
the most obvious situation of Jason and Devin McCourty. Yeah. You know, Devin McCourty plays as a, as a uh, or I should say Jason plays as a true freshman, Devin red shirts. Jason ultimately gets drafted and now just signed a new contract. He's going to be in the NFL for a long time. Devin is here for five years and then is a first-round draft pick. But both of them are going to be highly su- successful in the NFL. You know, Anthony Davis in the offensive line comes here and from about the third or fourth game is a starter for us, stays three years and leaves early. And a guy like Kevin Haslam doesn't start until his fourth year in the program, starts for two years, and now he's playing for the Raiders. So I think what you, you find is ultimately what happens after three, four, or five years is not determined in the first month that they're in the program. Mm-hmm. Well, we've got more to do, a couple of more questions to get in. We'll talk about the Howard game coming up. We have, though, our first ticket winner, our athletic director, Mr. Mm-hmm. Tim Pernetti, was – Nice enough to donate four of his 50-yard line seats for the game this week. Our winner is Calvin Schwartz. Mr. Schwartz, if you are in the building, four right here. We have them for you. Come on up and get them. We'll take a quick time out, get some more questions in. Stay with us right here. From Nelligan Sports, this is the Kyle Flood Show. Are you a golfer, always wanted to experience the pride and privilege of membership at a private club like Forsgate Country Club in Monroe Township? Thought membership was simply out of reach, unattainable? Well, think again. Forsgate, the area's premier family club, is home to two championship courses, including the legendary Banks course. Act now to take advantage of Forsgate's fall for free promotion. All you do is join now for 2013, and you can golf for free for the remainder of 2012. As a member, you'll have unlimited access to both courses Courses, practice range and facilities, professional lessons, special golf and social events, casual and formal dining, and more. And get this, there is no initiation fee and never an assessment at Forsgate Country Club. Some restrictions do apply. Call membership director Carol Rutherford for details at 732-656-8914. That's 732-656-8914. Yes, you can become a member of one of the finest clubs in the state, known affectionately by its members as The Gate. Forsgate. Does that guy look suspicious to you? Who? The one up front, with the coat and backpack. He's been looking around nervously since he got on the bus. Yeah, he keeps looking around, but not at anyone. He's fidgeting, his hands are in his jacket pockets. What are you doing? I'm texting against terror. Why take a chance? Text your message to NJTPD, and the NJ Transit Police are alerted to suspicious activity. Text your message to NJTPD. I have it bookmarked in my contacts. Join the biggest names in music, film, and television, and the millions who are standing up to cancer. This is the moment. This is the movement. Stand up with us. Tune in September 7th at 8 Eastern, 7 Central on ABC, CBS, Fox, and NBC. Check your local listings for cable providers. Stand up to cancer. Now, back to the Audi Rutgers Club at High Point Solutions Stadium in Piscataway for more of the Kyle Flood Show on that new talk radio, 1450 WCTC and WCTCAM.com. Once again, here are your co-hosts, Chris Carlin and Eric Legrand, along with Rutgers head football coach, Kyle Flood. A couple of minutes left on the second edition of the Kyle Flood Show right here on Our Vision on ScarletKnights.com and on the new talk radio, 1450 WCTC, a reminder, Brother Jimmy's Barbecue, the official barbecue provider to Rutgers football. It is the perfect destination for all things barbecue, sports, and fun. Okay, home opener this week against Howard. First of all, you know, you talked a little bit about uh, the fact that they had their come-from-behind win this past week. Uh, What have you seen on tape? What can you expect from this football team for fans who are unfamiliar, which is pretty much all of us? You know, they they challenge you uh, on, on offense. You know, they're going to play a, a 4-2-5 configuration, which means four down linemen, two linebackers, and really five defensive backs. And they want to pressure you. They want to get up the field. You know, they try to be multiple in some of the fronts that they play. And then they do the same thing on offense. You know, their, their head football coach has experience playing in the NFL, playing in the World League. And you see that with the way they run their offense. Different personnel groups that bring different elements to the game. They have some personnel groups where they look a little bit like us, like a pro-style offense. And then you'll see them out there with one tight end and three receivers, and all of a sudden you're defending spread offensive plays. And it really forces you to be sound on defense or you give up big plays. Coach, can you talk about how important it is for the players now, how they get their st- film study and on opponents each week, you know, going into you get your time with your coaches and everything. But talk a little bit about how they have to go on their own and 
look at the film and break down with their certain position or their certain player that they're going to go against to find certain advantages. Time management is always at a premium, mm. and you know how we do it here. We have a time management book that every player has that has their classes, their study hall, their, their meeting times, et cetera, on it. And all the great players I've ever been around, they, they always go above and beyond. It's not just come in in the morning, do football until noon, and then go to class and never come back. You know, all the really great football players at Rutgers that I've been around, they're in the building all hours of the day, and they come back in the afternoon when they're not in class, and you see them in the film study room. You know, when they get a break from study hall, they're in the film study room. And this building becomes a big part of their life. We have a question from this young lady over here. Your name and where you're from. Hi, Coach. Lori Kay from North Brunswick. I'm a 30-year season ticket holder. And my daughter was three weeks old when she came to her first game. And my son was 10 days old at his first football <laughs> game. So they've really grown up with Rutgers football. And we've watched a lot of players over those 30 years. And even though for you that this is your first year as a head coach, you've been here a while, and you've been able to watch a lot of players too. So over the years, what's been the best part of watching players grow and progress as a coach? The best part for a lot of us as coaches is when they come back. And I can, I can point to a, a very specific recent moment when Anthony Davis was in town, and obviously everybody knows he's from Piscataway. He was home in the summer, and we had our high school camp going on. And I happened to be down here in the stadium, and I was watching some of the teams that were, uh, that were participating. And down the tunnel, come, out the tunnel comes Anthony Davis. And I didn't even know he was coming down that day. He was just coming down to say hello. And when you hear about their experiences, and, and it's certainly nice to hear about his in the NFL, but whether it's Anthony there or a guy like Mike Fladell, who's actually living down in Arkansas now, you know, they're, it's great just to hear how they're doing, how their families are doing. And every one of them to a man always says something about how this program helped them get to where they are now. Those are the things that coaches value even more so than the wins. You know, you. playing in the league or not, whether they're, whatever they're doing in life, a large goal of this program for a long time has been to prepare you for life, not only after football, after college as well, whether you're going to play professionally or not. Absolutely. And even if you're... Even if you're one of the most fortunate to play in the NFL for 10 years, at the end of your career, you're 32 years old, and you've got a lot of life to live, and, and hopefully it's the education and the experiences you get from a place like Rutgers University that, that allow your quality of life to sustain after you're done in a place like the NFL. And it's great to know that, you know, the foundation that's built here, you know, a whole bunch of NFL players come back here and lift in the all season and just, just love to be around, you know. This is a family place. Can you talk a little bit about how everyone likes to come back and be joking around in the locker room just like they were here five years ago? It was one of the things that made this job very important to me. I, you know, having been here seven years as an assistant and, and coaching a lot of the players here on offense and interacting with a lot of the players on defense, I want this to feel like home. You know, when, I'm, when it's the offseason, whether it's the McCordys or Brian Leonard or Ray Rice or Kevin or Jeremy Zuta, whoever it is, they're in the building working out, they're coming back to visit. I know for them it's important to have a familiar face in that head coach's office, and, mm -hmm. and it's not Greg Schiano anymore. That just made this job even more important to me because this is, this is, it's not just family that we wear on our wrist. This is not a football team. This is a football program, and a football program should transcend any one year, and, and I think we've been able to do that. Coach, another hour has come and gone. Thanks again for joining us as you do each and every week. Well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate everybody coming out this evening. Absolutely. We're here at the Audi Raptors Club. One programming reminder, next week's show will be on Tuesday night here at the Audi Rutgers Club. Short week next week with the game against South Florida on Thursday night. So, again, that will be next Tuesday night. This week, Rutgers hosts Howard. Get your tickets. Visit ScarletKnights.com. It is 3.30 on Saturday, and they're urging everybody, get here early. Check out the Block R party. Make sure you go to the pep rally, which is at the Student Involvement Fair stage on Friday at 5 o'clock. Voorhees Mall in front of Murray Hall. For Eric Legrand and the coach, Kyle Flood, I'm Chris Carlin. We're looking forward to seeing you on Saturday at High Point Solutions Stadium. Have a great rest of your week, everybody. Rutgers head football coach has been a sports presentation of the New Talk Radio 1450 WCTC and WCTCAM.com, the voice of the Scarlet Knights.